Evidence indicates China will invade Taiwan during the chaos of the next American presidential election. This presentation details how they will use their unique near space capabilities to prevent the United States and her allies from intervening in that fight. Let's start with a few of the more startling conclusions and then you're welcome to watch the presentation itself for those details. These American government entities have been informed to the extent that you see here. Near space systems are not the harmless balloons with cameras that the American government wants you to believe. Take a look at these videos from Ukraine. These are simple drones dropping warheads on tanks and killing them. Eighteen years ago, the American government worked on doing exactly the same thing from 65,000 feet, except using guided weapons like these. They're far, far more dangerous. China can do that today. Such weapons from the stratosphere would carry warheads like this one. It's called an expanding rod warhead and is quite common on air-to-air -air missiles today. With that capability, killing airliners like this is really easy because you simply drop an air-to-air -air missile on it from 30,000 feet above. With that capability, China will kill a few airliners in American airspace, and Japan, the Philippines, whoever else may be trying to help Taiwan, and give all of us a choice. You can either have your airspace, or you can try to help Taiwan, but not both. If the Allies were then to try to help Taiwan, that same capability would be used to kill these, which are the radar protection for the carriers and other ships. With their long-range radar protection gone, the carriers and other ships will be vulnerable to wave after wave of sea-skimming cruise missiles. Similar missiles dropped from 65,000 feet would destroy the radars on the carrier escorts, leaving those very valuable ships pretty much on their own. If you're trying to see them with a satellite, these are not real numbers, they're just close. The satellite can tell you that the carrier is inside this two-ish kilometer diameter circle. It's somewhere in there. That's great for knowing where the carrier is. That is not going to get your missile on top of it. If you're looking at the same thing from, let's say, 15 or 18 miles away, now you have 50 meter accuracy. More like that. Well, if you take the same idea, maybe even with the very same drop missile, and put an optical seeker on it, now you've got that. And it's really nice of the Air Force with such high contrast tarmac underneath their airplanes. So ballistic missiles are the brightest things that man makes that doesn't have a nuke attached to it. This one happens to be launching from the water, but the ones launching from land are the same. Really, really bright. World's easiest target to see. You float a couple of balloons over the top of this thing with probably that same infrared seeker you had for airplanes. And these things can no longer launch. If you launch one, the reference is going to fall in Wyoming or wherever you launch it from. Therefore, you cannot retaliate, which means you don't have deterrence anymore, except for the submarine launch stuff. Well, why can't they launch? What happens? They get shot down. So the, the balloon. In other words, those asymmetric capabilities means China wins, the rest of the world loses. Here's your table of contents. Pause here to take a look and then either watch the entire presentation or skip ahead to the parts you like. You would please. Our class today is China's airships, proof of a new theater of battle. And our instructor today is Ed Hurley. Keep her straight. Ed has an MA, a master's in national security studies from California State University and a BS in Engineering and Political Science from the U.S. Air Force Academy. Ed is a recognized authority on near space or stratospheric unmanned systems. He's a pilot, both military and civilian aircraft, and served in the Air Force Space Command developing, developing unmanned space systems and unmanned systems. 
Thank you, Ed, for teaching today at Pellet. And here's Ed. Good afternoon. Let's see if we can make this work. There you go. <laughs> so um, I promise to ruin your whole day. The point to this, and for context for me, who was here for the first presentation a few months ago? This one answers the questions I would not answer that time. <laughs> well, I knew the answer. <laughs> and the reason is that history is replete with battles that were lost to surprising technology. And Pearl Harbor is our classic example, 9-11 is also a classic example, where if we had had any idea that things like shallow running torpedoes or hijacking airliners to use their 200,000 pounds of fuel as a weapon, they would have been fairly easily shot, but we didn't see it coming. That's what I think is going on here. And I think the fight over Taiwan, which I believe will happen in about 14 months or so, is going to be absolutely disastrous for the Navy. For our Navy? Our Navy. Yeah. So if I were to board game it right now, I'd rather be China. That's a pistol. So if I had to choose a side today, I'd choose China. The, uh, there were three officers assigned to uh, this work in Air Force Space Command from 2003 to 2005. So I was one of them. That's what that Space Command team needs. At the time, the Air Force Chief of Staff uh, got a, a, a little brief like they always do, saying, hey, if we can take these things and have them sit at 12 miles and not go away, we can do all kinds of wonderful stuff. So he gave that job to the space guys because even though it was in the atmosphere, the atmospheric piece was pretty easy. It was the 24 seven never go away operation that the space guys understood and the air guys did not. That's why it ended up over here on Peterson. It was given to an office that had the only, uh, basically the only flyers in space command who had legitimate space badges. And by legitimate, I mean, we actually earned the space badge that wasn't some honorary thing they gave to the colonels. Therefore, because we had expertise in both worlds, this became our problem. And really all we did was our meetings. So after I got fired from that job, because we all got fired, uh, I was Air Force Reserve officer the whole time, had a civilian life. So as part of that civilian life, I continued working on this stuff. And there's me at one of the many large national unmanned systems shows that I went to speak at for my company, which is that little logo there on the screen. Also, once that connection to the government was severed and the ideas were then on affairs, I figured out how to do a few things and got a patent on it. So I have a patent on the technology that China's flying over us, and I guarantee they've seen this thing too. Anyway, so much for the attention steps. Let's uh, start with the correct terminology because frankly, the, those blabbering heads on TV never get it right. <laughs> First of all, the thing the Chinese flew over us was not a balloon. A balloon is like the things that flew over here in Labor Day, unguided, goes up and down, wherever the wind pushes them, that's where they go. The Chinese thing was an airship, because as you can see, airships have power. They can either propel themselves or at least influence their direction because they have some kind of propulsion. Therefore, the Chinese thing was an airship. It was not a balloon. That's the, the bottom line to this. An aerostat is just a light in the air thing that has a rope down to the ground, and an airplane is an airplane. Very simple. Yes, ma'am. Where is near space? We and the Chinese both define it the same way as the atmosphere between 20 and 100 kilometers above the surface. Now, you, you really should round that down a little bit, and I'll show you why in just a second. So, for our purposes, it's roughly 60 to 100,000 feet. For practical purposes, it's like 60 to 80,000 feet. The idea is you want to be as low as you can and survive the wind. Where are those winds generally? 
This is a cartoon from the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association, if I got that right, that shows where the jet streams are on the planet, northern and southern hemisphere. They go in the same direction because of the Earth's rotation. The closer you get to the poles, the higher the wind velocity gets. And is that because the wind's moving faster? No, it's because the Earth is moving slower under it. But anyway, you can see that there are jets around the tropics, and you, you see Hawaii right there. That's relevant because on a video here in a few minutes, a very prominent government official is going to lie to you. So note the jet stream that goes over Hawaii. And then the northern one is the one that pushes everything over the continent of the United States. It's also the one you see on TV, goes up and down, and the weather moves around there. That is the jet stream is brutally hard to handle. None of this lighter than air solar power stuff can live there. They just can't. And this is why. So this is a wind profile of the jet stream. And I will, I know that this is in metric and that freaking everybody out. We'll get the English a little bit later. Except for you. <laughs> so the velocities are really high right where airliners fly. You've rounded off 35-ish thousand feet. So airliners, for example, have to plan to either stay in it to get a boost or avoid it in order to go in the other direction. When you get up here towards 60-ish thousand feet, the wind velocity drops off to almost nothing. Some days it is nothing. There's almost no reason to go higher. The idea then is to fly as low as you can where you can handle the wind. Here's a typical but more detailed jet over the continental United States. And Sandy, all those little streaky things, those are reported by balloons. So when the weather balloons go up, there's 900-ish a day around the world. They're recording those tracks that turn into this report. This one's interesting because I added the Chinese airship's ground track. You will see this again. Note that it goes across the wind. It could not do that if it was inside the jet. It just couldn't. What can fly in near space? Well, this photo I like, this came from a hobby balloon. Somebody stuck the camera on basically a modified weather balloon and took it up to, this looks to me to be 85-ish thousand feet or so. And just took a picture. So hobby balloons do this all the time. Of the balloons in the air, on any given day, roughly 10 ish percent or about 100 of them are hobby balloons like this, or even just a glorified dry cleaning bag with like a little five gram payload on it. Those can get up there too. This is a modified weather balloon invented by a company called Space Data Corporation out of Phoenix. This is 40 year old technology. What they did was have invented a payload controller thing here that alternately lets out some gas or drops some little plastic beads for ballast, and they can control the balloon's height. So they can control where it stops floating. It's just like a ship. Its weight and the <laughs> gas in it defines exactly where it's going to stop. They could do that to go up and down. <laughs> and therefore take the payload down here, which is a radio relay, and kind of keep it over the oil fields in Oklahoma and Texas for one or two days, relaying telemetry from the remote oil rig back to the owners. They would fly it, it would go up and down until it got blown out of its uh, orbit area, which it eventually would. They would cut the thing loose, come down in a little parachute with a note that said, hey, mail this back to me and we'll give you 50 bucks. <laughs> okay, and they would get most of them back. Most of those weather balloon payloads come back the same way. They have the same note, and they get most of those back too. And they go back up. People just drop them in the mail, and it goes up again. But this would not be considered powered. No power at all. No, at the mercy of the wind, it changes altitude to go in a different direction. Detail on that. But the question really is, how can this control its direction? It, because this is essentially a weather balloon and they also have all the weather data around them, they know where the wind is going at various levels. So they want to go that way, they just float into that wind and off they go. 
when they're done going that way, they change when they go back the other way. Very, very simple. It's what the Chinese will do to us. And I'll explain that here further. There are also in near space what are called super pressure balloons, which is a balloon made of essentially polyethylene, which is this film right here, that when it's launched, it looks sort of like a light bulb. However, it is sealed. The gas cannot get out. Therefore, when it gets to its float level, it has self-inflated to look kind of like a pumpkin. These straps here are the load-bearing web that takes the load of the payload, spreads the load around the gas bag, and gives it shape. This is the infamous Chinese whether or not a balloon. Okay. And that's how it was made. That's why it looked sort of round. Then you can also have airships. The Chinese are quite open about their near space program. So this is a Chinese lecture on YouTube where the gentleman is explaining how they would do airships. Actually, I think it's how they do airships today. This one is huge. That's going to be pushing 150 meters. You can tell because the payload is fully inside and this is a, I believe that's a radar. I'll show you the American version of it later. Therefore, because there's so much volume in here, you could put in huge payloads. The only, the only limiting factor really is their weight, not their volume. You also have a huge area for solar cells on there, huge area for batteries of whatever your storage means is. And therefore, you end up with something you can carry huge but lightweight payloads with almost infinite power. Again, it's a weight issue, it's not a volume issue. So, airships can fly there. So, how does this size compare to the, the Hindenburgs, the classic 1930s airships? Yeah. They're very similar. Size wise? Yes. So, those, some of those airships pushed a thousand feet. You know, they're easily 750 feet. The Navy had a couple that they actually had airplanes in. Floating aircraft carriers. You know, you can, and you see the Goodyear blimp now. Uh, it's larger than that. The Goodyear blimp is tiny. It's 150 ish feet. Okay. Uh, keep that in mind, though, because I'll show you some that the Chinese are flying today that are on the order of the Goodyear blimp, basically prototypes. This one would have to be really huge. Uh, let's round it down to 500 inch feet in order to lift that kind of a payload. Okay, the question is how efficient are these? And there's two parts to that. Aerodynamically, this is really, really hard to do. And I'll show you the shapes in the second half of the presentation after the break. The shapes up there get really weird. They don't look like this. And China knows that. So they're showing you a cartoon that doesn't look like a real airship at 65 ish thousand feet. As far as how efficient they are, are they to use, the alternative is either relays of, say, 24 hour endurance turbofan power drones, like the Global Hot, which are brutally expensive. We're talking like $8 million an hour to be there, or satellites. And if you want a satellite in low orbit to look at one spot and never break where you, you don't have any gaps in coverage, you have to start by launching 50 of them to monitor one spot on the planet, 50 of them to start. So as far as efficiency in that context, these are wonderful. That's skipping ahead. That's actually why our team got fired from Space Command, because we promised to deliver way better coverage for 1 100 of anything that anybody else was doing. That didn't work. This is an American prototype that did fly and crash. And then in the inset is the American thing that was being developed. So this one here, Lockheed Martin. High altitude long endurance dash demonstrator, otherwise known as LD. Uh, it was designed for our program. So I, I understand this thing not quite as well as the Lockheed Engineers, but pretty darn close. And it was a prototype for this thing, which was designed by the Missile Defense Agency, essentially, more than that, but to sit out over our coast at 65,000 feet and look outward over the oceans for low altitude cruise missiles. So submarine launch cruise missiles are brutally hard to find 
And when you find them with like a shore based radar or a ship based radar, you have maybe 200 seconds to deal with them. Maybe, depending on how fast they are. Maybe 200 seconds. And if you make them stealthy, it's over. So this thing in here is all radar. Lockheed was going to take a radar and design it as a fabric structure inside the airship. So the radar would hold the airship together. And therefore, you're more efficient with your weight. Because again, weight is a real problem at those altitudes. So if your structure doubles as your payload, bonus. Now you look at one weight instead of two. Uh, so all of this was payload. And then, of course, you've got propulsion and other stuff around it. What else can fly there? Well, airplanes. Zephyr is almost 25 years old. That's this thing it's called Zephyr. It started out as a UK sort of spooky program thingy that they lost interest in and transferred it to NASA, which is where it is now. So 25 years later, it's still there. It's still doing stuff. It claims to have flown at, I think, 76,000 feet, which I think is credible. The Chinese one there at the bottom is, uh, let's call it a bit crude. So instead of using like two really big, very efficient propellers, you can see it uses a whole array of essentially off the shelf, but it still flies. They claim 65-ish thousand feet, which again, I think is credible. And once you get up there, you don't really ever have to come back. You can stay up there as long as you want. This is the infamous Chinese not a balloon. The thing to learn here is that these are propellers and this big blob in the middle is all the machinery that makes the whole thing work. So these huge solar cells here are uh, generate energy that's both used right away by the props and stored there in the middle and whatever payload they chose to fly is in the middle. They fly a lot of these things. The thing to, to see here is that this uh, power generation and storage capability tells you by definition it is power. You don't need anything like this kind of power for cameras and, and satellite relays. Therefore, you can glance at this thing and tell it's an airship because it's generating way too much power for anything that's not transmitting like a laser, which use a lot of power. So if you're not Using your power on your payload, which thing, this thing does not, you by definition must have a lot of control. And all of theirs look like this. You will see that thing again. Remember where that machine was fired. Okay, how high can they fly? There we go. You're going to go back to English. You're welcome. This is the Chinese cartoon that they published for their airship. And it actually looks reasonably accurate as into what they really flew. And I'll show you that here in a minute. This one would generally fly 65-ish to 75-ish thousand feet, this kind of thing. And this is roughly the size of the Goodyear Blimp. 150-ish, 180-ish feet in there someplace. Because again, it's a prototype. Prototypes only really need to answer the, the engineering questions, they don't need those big radar payloads, for example. And if you stick around for the second half, I'll show you that the shape on the prototype will be quite different than the shape on the full size thing because of its own. Again, this is a cartoon. So airships would fly, let's round it off at 65 or thousand. Again, you fly as low as you can to get up into a wind you can tolerate. Then you've got the free floating balloons, this one in 2009, the manufacturer would sell you, they claimed a 2,000 pound payload at 80,000 feet, uh, which seems reasonably okay enough. Now the, uh, the gas bag there is gonna be on the order of the one that, on the Chinese airship, 200 or so feet. Volume is really not a problem. So you, you wanna lift more, you gotta take more gas. The problem is not lifting to an elevation, the problem is climbing. The rough rule of thumb is that for a given weight, right in your in this environment already, rising 10,000 feet will double your gas volume. Double. 
So rising is really, really hard once you get in the 60 ish thousand foot range. So not down here where the air is pretty thick, but once you get up there, it's a whole different story. Really hard to climb. Uh, so the question is to get there, do they have to go through all the wind? Absolutely. And surviving the jet stream is brutal. I mean, there are stories of these huge scientific balloons that were actually tumbled in the jet stream. You know, you take basically a light bulb and you spin it. Now, the answer to that, of course, is to launch it from a place where there's no jet stream above you, which is called Hainan Island off the coast of China. That's why their balloon launch pad is there. There's no jet above it. Right. So, what can these things do? We had two jobs. One was surveillance. One was communication. If you put cameras on these things that stare downward, and you you have to stare into valleys or between buildings, which limits you know how far away from the camera you can be, you know, um, what angle you can have. You could have about a 13-ish nautical mile wide footprint and see everything forever. You put three of those over the DMZ, you're looking eight or nine miles into North Korea and you're still on your side. Lots of overlap, no gaps in coverage. You, you couldn't be a, a pilot and see anyone. So that we could do. If you put those over Baghdad, say five of them, then you end the you end the insurgency in Iraq, which was our bad, because you cannot have an insurgency under a hand. Insurgencies cannot survive without hiding in the population. Therefore, if you can put cameras over whatever your your area of interest is, you can then solve the hardest problem for intelligence, like in gathering intel, which is in hand. overhead surveillance. Gives you all kinds of really pretty pictures, but you can't look at a vehicle or a person and know their intent. You might know what they are, where they are, where they came from, maybe where they're going, but you can't determine their intent. If that vehicle stops and plants a bomb on the side of the road, now you know his intent. If you see him in real time, you might chase him down. But what you can really do is run your record backwards. You take your permanent record. Oh, look, they planted a bomb. Or look, I found a bomb. Or look, there was an assassination. I don't care what your event, your event is that solves the intent. You play your unbroken record backwards, and the vehicle goes back to some spot, picks up the bomb. You run that point forward and backwards to find everybody who touched that spot. And then at 2.30 in the morning, the guys in green go visit them. Part of our job. You could also doing signals intelligence, suck up electrons from a whole lot farther away than a camera is going to be useful. The other thing you can do, and the Army actually wanted this more than the cameras, is you can connect communication. Your one platform, whatever it is, could connect anybody inside that 300 nautical mile wide. That means your helmet mounted radio could talk to anybody else with that radio anywhere in the green. Further, they could talk to anybody on the planet going through whatever your vehicle was. That's that was the army's highest priority because in Afghanistan and even in some of the, the urban areas in Iraq, they would lose communication. And then it would might be over at that point. So this is what they wanted, and this is easy. This is so trivially easy that the commercial folks. We're going to use this to create the internet everywhere. You can create the internet everywhere. You can also, the not joke, is park one of these things over Castle Rock, and you would have one cell tower from Pueblo to China. So unless you, <laughs> unless you drive underground, you'd have one cell tower. That's how easy this is. Way ahead of my notes. All right, how do you find these things? Because that was an issue here recently. You've got all the normal phenomenologies that you see there. Radar, which is what we rely on in the United States and pretty much everywhere. Radar is really difficult because these things don't reflect radar. It's polyethylene. Okay, they are inherently stealthy. 
if that Chinese thing hadn't had all this machinery hanging on it, it would have been nearly impossible to see with radar. And it is just stunningly easy to make these truly stealthy. So radar is really, really light. Yes, sir. No, but so is Sarah. Uh, are they uh, invisible to radar? So the question is, are solar cells invisible to radar? No, but you angle them. So that's what you do in space, too. If you want to hide the space, you angle your stuff so that the reflected light doesn't go with whoever wants to see it. Same thing. So really, heat, <clears throat> if this thing is unpowered, it is the same temperature as this background. No heat. The airshipy thing that got shot, I'll show you where it shot here in a second. The missile hit the only warm spot on it, which was the machine reactor. Now, do you get sun heating on these things? Sure, on top, mostly. Does the sun heat up the solar cells? Sure, can angle it, depends. If you know that a heat seeker is looking at you, then again, this is pretty easy. Optical is the way you find these things. And it's the way the American civilians found these things. You'll see that in an interview here shortly. It is really, really hard to hide them optically, especially when the sun is underneath them. So sunrise and sunset. It's not impossible by any means. And if they're white, okay, there they are. But optical is the easiest way to find these things. Now you've got clouds. And you've got darkness. Then we get to the part about why did it surprise the Air Force? Well, as I've said several times, we were fired, but we weren't just dismissed. We, um, of the three officers in that group, none of them were in uniform in a year, as in completely gone. And the corporate memory was willfully erased so that there was no handoff. So, for example, at the end of this talk, you will know more about this than anybody on computers. I'm not making this up. Maybe one secret squirrel I talked to still remembers, but the uh, but there's no corporate memory. If you don't have any corporate memory to know to look for something, then you don't plan to look for it, and therefore it's a surprise. It really is as simple as that. Okay, the interesting thing is the, the lady that you'll see in here who owns the radars in Alaska. That was my job in the my dad's job rather in the early 1980s, which is why I was from Alaska. They will also talk, she will talk about a filter. When they moved the filter, they could then see everything. Well, the filter is called a Doppler. Do we have any radar issue people? Weapons radar, respectfully. So let's say that you have a really nice big radar and you're looking over the horizon, or you're in an airplane or a missile, and you're looking for stuff down low, whatever it is. You don't want to see the ground because if you see the ground, then that's all you're going to see is the ground. So radars use a principle called Doppler, and the classic example is a train going by you. As the train is coming toward you, the sound waves are being compressed by the train's velocity. You hear a high pitch. When the train is abreast, you hear normally the horn. When the train is going away, the sound waves are being stretched out by the train's velocity, and you hear a lower pitch. That effect is called Doppler, and it happens on radar, light, everything else. If it's got waves, you can squish them and, and extend them. So for a radar, you then measure a target's relative velocity going to you or away from you by how much it changes the frequency of the beam you shot at it. You can then know, because you're still, that if I erase the velocities between some gates, let's say, 80 knots, 80 nautical miles an hour. That if the thing isn't traveling to me or away from me more than 80 nautical miles an hour, my system erases it. I don't see it, but it's a tree. If it's not moving, it's a tree, and I don't want to see a tree. The problem is that it erases all the slow moving stuff. So when they said we didn't see it, it's because it was erased by their system. Everybody does that. Russians do that, everybody, and they have to. The big picture of potential threats to North America is captured at places like this, a long-range radar station on the Aleutian Peninsula. It's a big picture, but some wonder whether it's wide enough. Colonel Brianna Fulton coordinates support for dozens of sites, including this one in King Salmon, Alaska. 
Can you tell us if, if these radar sites were able to see the balloon? These radar sites were absolutely able to see the balloons. So where was the disconnect? The disconnect is primarily in how we filter the data. Officials now looking at more raw radar data in order to better pick out slower objects like balloons as it pushes for newer systems that can actually see over the horizon. We do not currently have that capability, but that is something that will be coming. Potential He's dead in real person speak is that when we eliminated the Doppler notch filter, then we could see it. And we could see a thousand of them every day. And many of them stay in the air for three or five days. And it's like we took out the Doppler notch. And, oh my God, the sky is full of these things, which it is. Next slide. What else flies up there? Um, this is a slide I made, and you can see that if you understand all the symbols, well, that was us from 2005. And it talks about the Navy and the Missile Defense Agency and civilian stuff. That straddle light in the corner was a commercial airship. You see how it's got this funny shape? It's because of its size. And it was covered with solar cells and going to make the internet. <laughs> Seriously, you could buy stock in this week. That's how big a deal it was 18 years ago. When our Air Force eliminated it, that basically eliminated the R&D money. So everybody else lost interest as well. It was also a big deal to the Air Force in lots of press releases. This was one of many. That's me down here. You only thought I was making this up. <laughs> and you can see there's all kinds of quotes about how wonderful this thing is going to be and how we're going to lead the world. And that was true until it wasn't. Then you get to the Air Force and Congress. I'll give you a second to read this. This is a transcript of his testimony. Now, look who this guy is. Undersecretary of the Air Force, Director of the National Reconnaissance Office, and the Chief Executive for Space. Not for near space, but for space. So he was the lead civilian in the whole Air Force for space. And this is what he's telling Congress about these floating airship activities. So again, there's one really big deal. Then we get to the part about, oh, before I forget, all that stuff he said, China can do that today. China could probably do that 15 years ago. I could have done that 15 years ago. Then, now we get into the, the new stuff that is the ruin your day part. Why didn't we wait to shoot it down? Well, the first part is we didn't see it. So the Colonel in Alaska says, yeah, we could see those things. It was just a filter issue. She was being honest, which means everybody who says, yeah, we watched this thing coming over the Aleutians all that thing, you didn't. Okay, anyone who tells you that is lying. The colonel just told you that until she changed the settings under the radar, she didn't see it. She could see it, but she did not. That was the truth. Saying that we watched the thing all the way across, that's a lie. Why did we wait to shoot it down? Well, again, the first part was that we couldn't see it. And then we said we, didn't want the wreckage falling, so Montana senator said, yes, only pray dogs, you know. <laughs> then it gets over the United States itself, and we didn't shoot it because we hadn't yet figured out how, and eventually it was over populated areas. Once it basically got out of Canada, you had other issues. But originally, we didn't see it, which this guy, I mean, that's North Tom, over here in Peter, just admitted. You have the people in the moment saying, Yeah, we didn't see it, we got to do better. Then you get to the part about what shot it down. Uh, do we have any other fighter pilots in here? I gave this 
presentation to a pure military group the other day, and I had a Navy fighter pilot say, I was fun. You can insult the Navy and have men here, but he's coming. <laughs> nothing better than that. So it was shot down by this thing, which is called an F-22, which is a 30-year-old stealth fighter, and the thing is a beast. It is also our highest flying fighter, and that matters. That's why it was up there, because none of our other fighters can go as high as this one. And it shot the thing down with what's called a Sidewinder missile. The Sidewinder design is old. The missile technology is really, really current and good. The thing to look on here, you see the fins in the front? You see how tiny those are? This is a low altitude, short range missile. It's literally a dogfight missile. Literally, you have to see your target to make this thing lock on. And it's not going to do you a whole lot of good above some altitude that I honestly don't have the answer to. Let's round it off at 40 ish thousand feet because you get too high and those little bitty fins there don't work anymore. There's not enough air for it to control the missile. Obviously, a low altitude, short range missile. If you want to be at high altitude, you want one of these. This is a MiG 31, very old airplane. It's designed originally, it was designed to chase a bomber we did not build. <clears throat> it's going to come over at 80,000 feet in Mach 3. So, this is a Mach 3 jet with torpedoes, basically. You see how big these things are? That's what you need to fly at high altitude with a missile. That's so you have high altitude missiles and low altitude missiles. We don't own any high altitude missiles. The United States doesn't build those because we don't have any targets up there. We are going to, in a minute here, play the audio of the, the kill. And let me cue this up so before I start right here. What they are trying to do is have one of them, it's called point. You'll hear them say point. That means my systems fix the target and transmit that data to you back here so you can shoot them farther away. Very easy for the F-22 to do. It's designed to do that. It failed here. And because it failed here, the shooter had to get much, much closer. You will hear them talk about the target at 64,000 feet. What goes by really fast is they say angels as desired, which means the shooter can go anywhere he wants. Angels are elevation. And he calls that he's going to approach it from 50, climbing through 50,000 feet and try to shoot at five miles. He's going Mach 1.3. The rule of thumb up there is that you travel one nautical mile for every one tenth mile. So he's doing 13 miles a minute. 13 miles a minute. Best to stay in the air because he has to. If he flies much slower, he's going to fall out of the sky. If he gets down to Mach 1, he's really pushing. So he's moving 13 miles a minute and he's trying to fire a short range, low altitude missile at a target with no handoff on the jet from the track on the line. Package, rank one, mistake, Charlie, Zulu, five, three, five, hold die, zero, one, one, 15, 64,000, heading one, four, zero, back us up because we don't have a high fidelity line on the coastline looking for you to provide uh, six miles net call when you are observing the doi at six nautical miles just an amendment to the game plan just based on the limited ability for eagle one to uh, point for frank one uh, eagle one will just marshal and commit north uh, in a trail of frank one i uh, will still uh, established role, Frank, Shooter, Eagle, the port, but it'll uh, help geometry to uh, help point. Uh, 100, Frank 1, engage. Charlie, Zulu, 535, bullseye, 050, 15, 64,000, track. Frank 1 is proceeding, outbound, copy restriction. Three state, DOI 1. Charlie Zulu 535, Bullseye 050, 15, heading 140, left. 
Eagle support Angels as desired. Point COI one Charlie Zulu five. Frank attack heading one four zero profile one point three mock climbing fifty k delivery five miles. Break one, splash one. That is a K kill. The balloon is completely on his tower. Break one. Season one is seen what appears to be metal chaff cloud, so I guess like metal breaking apart and stream for now. Break one. Season one. Stay there a second. What you see in this picture, this is the F-22. Again, moving at 13 miles a minute. The missile, regardless of how fast you are when you launch the missile, it <laughs> settles down at about Mach 2. So it just it just does. So here you have a missile that it almost instantly reaches Mach 2. And here you got the shooter, the target, and at Mach 2, the missile's already halfway there. But Mach 2 is not much faster than this guy. That means that when this thing hits that thing, this guy is going to be really close. And I'll show you what that means here in a few minutes. That also answers the question about why you can't shoot it with a gun. And I'll explain that in a second. Here. You remember that uh, machine we payload, I think? That's where the warhead detonated. This is uh, the dark stuff there is the high explosive in the warhead. And this was taken a fraction of a second before the shock wave hit the balloon, which then just blew it apart. One thing to uh, almost a uh, passing interest, when the balloon was hit, there was a huge puff of white stuff. That wasn't smoke, that was talcum powder. When you make these things, you fill them with a powder so they don't stick. And that way you can fill them up and they're not stuck together. That's interesting because when you see it later, the talcum powder marks the spot and everything fell from there. Um, since you're all highly educated now, why did the missile hit the machinery section? Heat sink. Heat sink and missile, it's the only warm thing on the balloon. Yeah, not the balloon. Okay. So, yeah, the machinery section was the only thing that you could make this hypersensitive seeker lock onto. And the other airplane couldn't make it work, leaving this guy kind of by himself. And when I, now that you are all highly educated, let's watch about a four minute interview that played just this last weekend. Earlier this year, the nation was captivated by a Chinese spy balloon drifting across North America. Turns out there's more, or is it less, to that story than meets the eye. David Martin takes us behind the headlines. It was surely the most bizarre crisis of the Biden administration. America's top of the line jet fighters, seen here in routine training, sent up to shoot down, of all things, a balloon. The balloon is completely destroyed. A Chinese spy balloon floating across the United States in your airspace espionage that had the nation and its politicians in a tizzy. I am so angry. I want to use other words, but I'm not going to. Now, seven months later, General Mark Milley, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, tells CBS Sunday morning the balloon wasn't spying. The intelligence community, their assessment, and it's a high confidence assessment, uh, that there was no intelligence collection by that balloon. So if it wasn't collecting intelligence, what was it doing over the United States? Why was it over the United States? There's various theories. The balloon had been headed toward Hawaii, but the winds at 60,000 feet apparently took over. At altitude, those winds are very high. Uh, the particular motor on that aircraft uh, can't go against those winds at that altitude. What do you think? You've seen the profile. Is the wind at 60,000 feet very high? No. And even if he, as a grunt, doesn't have a clue, you've got all the kinds of pilots around him know exactly what's going on. So he's lying to you. I, I can't think of another way to put it. 
because the whole point to the airship's elevation, 64,000 feet, right, when it was hit, was to get out of those winds. Now, the other thing, that he, they were going to Hawaii and they got blown off course, what do you think of that? No, if you want to go to Hawaii, you just ride in the polar jet and it's going to go pretty much over Hawaii. So the balloon-ish thing was where it was because it wanted to be there. And at least one leading theory is it was blown off track. Over Alaska and Canada and then down over the lower 48 to Billings, Montana. I just happened to notice out of the corner of my eye uh, a white spot in the sky. Citizen uh, photographer Chase Doak recorded it from his driveway. I, of course, landed on the most logical explanation that it was an extraterrestrial craft. <laughs> he had studied photojournalism in college. Took a photo, took a quick video, and then I grabbed a few coworkers just to make sure that I wasn't seeing things and had them take a look at it. You'll probably never take a more famous picture. No, I don't think I ever will. <laughs> he tipped off the Billings Gazette, which got its own picture, and he told anybody who asked they could use his free of charge. I didn't want to make anything off of it. I thought it was a national security issue and all of America needed to know about it. As the U-2 spy plane tracked the 200-foot balloon, Secretary of State Blinken called off a crucial trip to China. China's decision to fly a surveillance balloon over the continental United States is both unacceptable and irresponsible. The president ordered the Air Force to shoot it down as soon as it reached the Atlantic Ocean. What were the orders? To shoot down a balloon six miles off the coast. Colonel Brandon Tellez planned the operation. This previously unreleased video shows his F-22s taking off for the mission. On paper, it looks like this colossal mismatch. Mm. One of this country's most sophisticated jet fighters. Yes, sir. Against a balloon with a putt-putt motor. <laughs> yes, sir. Was it a sure thing? Uh, sir, it's a sure thing, no doubt. It would have been an epic fail. Yes, sir, it would have been. But if you would have seen that, you know, first uh, shot miss, there would have been three or four right behind it that ended the problem. Did you have a plan B in case the uh, the air-to-air -air missiles didn't work? Sir, we had a plan Z. You were ordered to engage. But it only took a single missile which homed in on the heat of the sun reflected off the balloon. Frank one. After the Navy raised the wreckage from the bottom, technical experts discovered the sun. Did you do that? You can tell that I'm wearing here that it wasn't tracking. Mm -hmm. okay. ...had never been activated while over the continental United States. By then, the damage to U.S.-China relations had been done. This silly balloon that was carrying two freight cars worth of its spine equipment was flying over the United States, and it got shot down, and uh, everything changed um, in terms of talking to one another. So bottom line, it was a spy balloon, but it wasn't spy. I would say it was a spy balloon that we know with high degree of certainty got no intelligence and didn't transmit any intelligence back to China. That's that true or false? Okay, go to the next slide. Um, I don't know. The question is, was it true or false they did not transmit anything back to China? I have no idea. I have no way to know. The, when you have a dictatorship like China, you've got one guy at the top, and the pieces below are incentivized to not cooperate because everybody wants to influence this one guy at the top and they don't want to be vulnerable to being whacked when the new guy comes in, whoever he's going to be. In that system, the guy at the top is routinely surprised by stuff that happens. So I would not be surprised at all if the Chinese military, which has flown these things around the world, they've, they've been photographed like 40 times doing this kind of stuff. If they had a mission they were going to plan over the United States, coincidental with the diplomatic stuff, the diplomats didn't know. They were truly surprised. And when we blamed China's civilian government and canceled the trip, the civilians were really mad at the military. Now, they're not going to tell you that, but I, that fits how their system works. As far as whether it collected any data, I don't know. And frankly, it doesn't matter. What they were doing was testing our reaction and our defensiveness.
if you're flying one of these things and you don't want to be shot, you just float around 68 or 70,000 feet and you're completely invulnerable. Even the F-22 can't get you. Therefore, they intentionally flew it, I believe, at a level where it was just barely possible to kill it because they were learned as much as they could by what we did. And it worked beautifully. So they, did they have any stuff in there that they wanted that they thought was important? Of course not, they're gonna lose it. Because there's no way we're gonna let this thing live. So that's what I think it was. I believe it was a test. <clears throat> so the, the question is, with all these other missions the Chinese are flying, how do they end the mission? What do they do with the payload? I don't know. We were going to parachute them back, or in my design, it was going to fly back. But it's just as easy just to cut it loose and bury it in the ocean. Because again, they're not carrying anything all that interesting. Electric motors, solar cells, some cameras, and satellite links, so on. And well, that was the ocean connection. Oh, yes. Well, it's being transmitted in real time. It's not like this in the black box. You cover it, you get information. They probably already have information. Okay. So the, the point is that it's not like the Chinese need to get this thing back to get the information off of it. Of course not. Most we don't get our satellites back. We don't. We either bury them in space or we bury them in the ocean. But we never get it back. The question is can a vehicle like this, because it's not just balloons. Yeah. Can it get better optical information as satellite? Absolutely. Just because it's closer? Much closer. But You're, what are they looking for? Like what's on an aircraft base? Well, the question is what would they be looking for over the United States? I mean, like, not much. No. Or is it transmission for radio? Well, okay. Recording the, it's called signals intelligence. That's actually better. For example, all the data links between the F 22s, they recorded all of that. Those data links are highly sensitive. The stuff they broadcast on the clear radio, which is why a guy on the ground could receive it because it's the United States and do that. He just had a little recorder running next to his radio and you could hear the jets in the back. So he was just sitting on the beach watching this. I guarantee the stuff moving between the jets that he did not hear was pretty interesting. So absolutely, they could pick that up. They're also at, let's say, 12 or 15 miles away instead of 200 miles away with a satellite, and they're moving a whole lot slower, a whole lot easier to track. Now, basically, no more sophisticated than your uh, digital camera. So yeah, being closer really, really, really helps. You see less, but you see it a whole lot more easily and a whole lot better. All right, can these things be armed? Yeah, obviously. No, they're, they're very good. So how would you arm these things? And here's the new piece. You would take little unguided missiles and drop them. This is Ukraine. Ukraine has gotten really, really good at taking rocket propelled grenade warheads or mortars, hanging them on drones, flying them over tanks, and dropping them through the hatch. In the top. And this is how they do it. Hey, thank you. So while we were working, there was a company that said, hey, we have this short range and big missile thing here. Why don't we build one for you? We'll take the motor off of it. We'll put it in two. It'll weigh 20 kilos, maybe. You put it on your airship, and it has a secret thingy on it. And when you want to kill something, you just lock your secret thingy on it. You just let go. And it dies. That's how it solves the problem. It avoids it. It dies. At the same time, the company that builds the Sidewinder, and here's one up close, they came to us and said, well, why don't you take these fins Remove the rocket motor, remove the fins up here behind the warhead. You got this little stubby thing that weighs half of what it would weigh normally. You hang that on your airship. And when you spot those cruise missiles streaking in over the water, because you can see them hundreds of miles out, you take our little thing, you drop it, it'll go through a mock above 40,000 feet and keep accelerating 
and it will run down your cruise missile for you and kill it. Simple. The hard part was getting these systems up above everybody else. The drop part and making it function after that is pretty simple. Well, if you think about that, uh, if you can run down and kill a cruise missile, then an airliner is pivotal. Yeah. So you could take a couple of these things and close all U.S. airspace at will, and any other airspace in the planet you want. And then you tell the people who own the airspace that you do what we want, or you're not going to fly again. Ever. That's what these things can do. I think they don't say that. Yeah, that's not good. That's not good. How would you do it? You don't need an airship. You all you need is a balloon. You take a balloon, and now you're back to latex because these things are simple. You give it a little solar cell. You give it some kind of a payload thingy holding one, two, or three of these little drop missiles. You know, configured however you want, and you just float them, and they go up and they go down, and they just fly the Albuquerque box to kind of hang out over, say, northern Colorado, because that's all you need. You put out as many of those as you want, which may only be three, <laughs> and you shut down the airspace. Now, what would you put in those? This is called an expanding rod warhead. It's a very old technology, 1950s. You take, essentially, a bunch of little steel or titanium rods and you spot weld them into a, a ring around your explosive charge and that's what they do. You don't want to hit your target with this thing. You just want to fly up next to it and blow up. And this will take the wing off there. Simple. Now, dog fights are not much fun to do that, by the way. The, um, most of the missiles today either fly with that kind of warhead or what's essentially the buck shot going out the size. What would you do with it? Well, if you invade Taiwan, you shoot down two or three airliners over the US, Japan, Australia, the Philippines, and anybody else who makes any noise, you close their airspace and you give them this twist. That's what you can do with an airspace balloon, not even an airship, just a balloon. And at that point, Taiwan loses. Because we're going to take our airspace over Taiwan for the we're not done yet. What else can you do? Well, the Navy relies very much on things like this. This is a radar surveillance and control airplane that flies off a ship. Okay. It's a very old design, but it's been modernized beautifully. You can take these things and you put them away from the carrier strike group a couple hundred miles, and nothing sneaks up on you that's on or above the surface. Nothing is going to sneak up on you past these things. They're really, really neat. Well, that little drop missile thing. So instead of a heat seeking uh, sensor on the front, you have a radiation sensor that finds that. You get up above those things, you drop a couple of them, and that's over. Now the battle group is not blind yet because they still have the radars on their own ships. Primarily destroyers that surround them and strike them. This just shows the drop missile thing spiraling down because it would just spiral in a certain pattern. Um, now, these things are radiating like an alpha. So it, radi it spirals down, hunts down the seeker, and detonates against that radar thing on the top. Yeah. With that expanding right away. 30 ish thousand. You know, often lower, but that's not a high up. We're not done yet. So now the strike group doesn't have any early warning. Well, you take those same things and you drop them on the Aegis radars, which are much brighter, much easier to see, and you detonate against their radars. That's not going to harm the ship all that much. However, without that radar, all those vertically launched missiles inside the air to surface to air missiles would be wonderful things. Some of them can be satellites. Those are limited, they can't be long. So now your strike group not only cannot see the threats coming in, but it can't shoot back and then it could. So what do you do with that? 
Well, the next thing you can do is take that really simple camera thingy you saw earlier, which is really high precision, but it's so close. And you transfer that guidance to the PL26 missile, I think it is, 2,500 mile ballistic missile with almost a ton of explosive. It's designed to kill carriers. So here you have the carrier with essentially no radar protection. Points. And of course, all those other ships too. If you're trying to see them with a satellite, these are not real numbers, they're just close. The satellite can tell you that the carrier is inside this two-ish kilometer diameter circle. It's somewhere in there. That's great for knowing where the carrier is. That is not going to get your missile on top of it. If you're looking at the same thing from, let's say, 15 or 18 miles away, now you have 50 meter accuracy. More like that. So that's how you kill a carrier structure. I'm not done yet. So now you're over the continental United States or anywhere else. You remember that Ukrainian drone thingy? Well, if you take the same idea, maybe even with the very same drop missile, and put an optical seeker on it, now you've got that. And it's really nice of the Air Force with such high contrast tarmac underneath their airplanes. And of course, if it's nighttime, you just use infrared. You also talked about what could they do? What would China benefit from floating one of these things over the US? The pictures that, that doesn't tell you anything new? No, because you can have someone uh, on a little hill off to the side of this thing, radioing back, they're having a picture, and they're just radioing back which of the parking spots are occupied. Now your missile has coordinates before you drop it. So the guidance is only for the terminal part, you know, the last 10 seconds or so. If you do that, you then eliminate one third of our nuclear threat to them. And here's how you eliminate another third. So ballistic missiles are the brightest things that man makes that doesn't have a nuke attached to it. This one happens to be launching from the water, but the ones launching from land are the same. Really, really bright. World's easiest target to see. You float a couple of balloons over the top of this thing with probably that same infrared seeker you had for airplanes. And these things can no longer launch. If you launch one, the wreckage is going to fall in Miami or wherever you launch it from. Therefore, you cannot retaliate, which means you don't have deterrence anymore, except for the submarine launch stuff. Well, why can't they launch the weapons? They get shot down. So the, the balloony things will kill this thing as it's climbing through maybe 25,000 feet. They'll, they'll hit it, tear a big chunk out of it. You saw what the warhead did, and the wreckage falls within sight of it. That's called the terminal phase. Ballistic missiles have, uh, I'm sorry, launch. They have launch or boost phase, mid course and terminal. Right now we can intercept at mid course and terminal. But it's really, really hard because you're going so fast and they're so far away. You want to shoot them while they're boosting. And just, but yeah, and the nice thing about shooting one like this is the warhead falls on the people who fire it. Again, this is what we're going to do to China 15 years ago. Then, because you have rockets, missiles and rockets, well, it's enough. The Space Force leaders are quite open about the fact that what they were building when I was there, which is room size satellites that cost $80 billion plus and that before you get the payload. Those things are really vulnerable. You can go off in a, up in a geosynchronous orbit, let's say 24,000 miles and float up right next to it, take a whole bunch of pictures and then you kill it. Not difficult at all. There, therefore, we are very vulnerable because we put all our money in those stuff. So this is the Space Force guy saying, well, now we're gonna to go to a lot of little satellites. And we're going to be able to launch them when we need them. Well, not if there's a balloon park over here in Montana. No. <laughs> Ballistic missiles are relatively fast. The search air missiles are really fast. Ballistic missiles are relatively fast. The space launch missiles are very slow because they want to maximize the payload they can lift. 
So they tend to be liquid fueled and slow. So now we go back to this same general. We saw him in the moment. So this is the head of the guy who's responsible for defending North America. Okay. So this is a reminder of what he said at the time. Now let's listen to what he said a few months later. A lot of people don't know a lot about NORAD, but they began to hear about it because of the Chinese balloon incident. Can you can you walk us through when that balloon was, was first spotted and, and when it became uh, a concern? I was made aware of the, uh, the PRC uh, high altitude balloon on the 27th of January, at which point I notified uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of our plan to intercept it and identify it on the 28th. And that's exactly uh, what we did. I would uh, tell you, Lester, that the process worked exactly as it should, and I kept the Secretary of Defense uh, in the loop uh, twice a day, every 12 hours, with the status of the uh, PRC uh, high altitude balloon. And if you thought it was a it was an imminent threat, you had the power to to deal with it. Yeah. So if it was an imminent threat, I absolutely am delegated that authority uh, by the government of the United States uh, through the President and the Secretary of Defense. What I would stress to you, Lester, is that. Uh, this turned out, I think, the best it could for our nation. We know that uh, no American people were injured. Uh, we maintained the safety. Uh, we know for a fact that we mitigated their collection and we maximized our collection. And we shot it down at the exact location we desired so that we could maximize that collection. There was obviously a great political debate over the timing of the shoot down. From your military perspective, did things go in the order they should have? The process worked exactly as it should have. I kept the secretary and the chairman uh, in the loop. I updated them every 12 hours. Uh, when asked for my advice, I provided that advice. What I would tell you is the balloon shoot down, uh, the president directed us to shoot it down safely, and we shot it down safely at the place and time of our choosing. Did you learn something, though, about our capa your capabilities in terms of detection? Uh, did you? Did you become aware of gaps that you didn't know existed? Uh, absolutely, we did. Uh, we we were not looking for a high altitude balloon at that time. Uh, at sixty five thousand feet, very slow. Our radars uh, are capable of seeing it, but we were filtering out that data, and so therefore we learned significantly. I also learned that I need to be able to see further, further out into the Pacific, further into the Arctic, and into the Atlantic, and that's what the over the over the horizon radars will give us. Oh, you believe hundred percent it was a it was a Chinese spy vehicle. Absolutely, it was a Chinese spy a balloon. I noticed when I came in, there's a Canadian flag flying outside this building. That's significant and says a lot about what you do. It does. We have uh, hundreds of Canadians that help us all over the United States and through Canada with the NORAD mission. It's the only binational command uh, like it, 65 years old now, uh, and it's an incredible uh, responsibility. It's an opportunity uh, to defend North America, not just the United States of America. The question is, why do we refuse to call it an airship and keep calling it a balloon? Because airships are scary and balloons are not. <laughs> Seriously, and if you stick around for another part, and I'm way along here, I will show you the Chinese airship. And if they had flown that over the US, you would go nuts. Because it's not something that's familiar. It's not something you can blow off as a party balloon or a weather balloon. So if they call it an airship, people like you would go, well, wait a minute, it looks like a balloon. Why do you why it's not a balloon? Then you start doing it. So I think it's because it's scary. They certainly know better. So the question is, what am I doing to inform the leaders? Well, it's like I paid the gentleman. Just send a check to What's going on? The question is, what's going on? I wish I knew. I honestly don't, because um, I'm about the most reliable source they're ever going to find. 
right? Those of you who were here a few months ago, remember I didn't go into most of this. Uh, so I'm only going into it now because I have checked and it's unclassified because it, it's like in the Tom Clancy. What he came up with on his own was by definition unclassified, even if he was right. Yeah. But I don't have an answer to your question because I'm not on the inside. I can tell you that since I know how to kill these things as well, we're not doing it. So we are now at the break, which you probably desperately need. Okay, we are back live. Mm -hmm. Let's see if I can make this <laughs> Okay, back into it for the fine detail. No, we're not catching up. Here you have the added volumes of the research papers by these countries on this near space stuff. So mostly aerodynamics. How would you fly there? How would you propel, propel these things? How would you control them? A bit about what would you do with them, right? If you look, this is the period we were operating. We, we terminated right here. Then when the United States got out of the business, we and our allies lost interest and stopped studying the environment. You can see what the Chinese did. And this is the stuff they published. Yeah. You can go on the internet and find this stuff. That's where this account comes from. Do they have been hiding? No, not at all. Well, they're, they're hiding a few things. Oh, of course. But they haven't been hiding the fact that they want to do this all the time. So are we catching up? No. That, by the way, this makes it an asymmetric capability. We should have explained that before. When you have an asymmetric capability, it means you can do something the other guy can. And maybe the other guy doesn't understand. Go back to Pearl Harbor. So the R Navy said, well, when you drop a torpedo off an airplane, it goes like down to 80 feet and then it kind of comes back up and then it settles. And Pearl Harbor is only 35 feet deep, so that's not going to work. The Japanese developed shallow running torpedoes, which really doesn't, wouldn't thin the stuff on the ground. Mm -hmm. And they practiced it in their own harbors. We didn't know. So they flew over Pearl Harbor with an asymmetric capability that we did not think was possible. That's what this is. And you can see the Chinese are still studying this stuff like crazy. Do they have more? They have a lot more. That airship they flew over us was, let's call it the latest of 40 sightings they've had over all kinds of countries. If you look at this particular version, I just randomly picked this one, you can see that its configuration is quite different than the one they flew over us. So they've been flying all kinds. This one's got a huge boom in the middle instead of just a little payload section. I think these are the propellers out here in the tips. So a completely different configuration, but it's the same idea. And literally, there are 40 photos like this. Running around. Yeah. The question is, if we've been seeing these for so long, what was our analysis of what they were doing? How did we react? I don't know, but I'm not inside the system anymore. I guarantee they weren't doing this 18 years ago when they retired. However, as we were doing our thing, they were building this, which is out in the Western desert. If you draw a line, by the way, about a third of the way from the Pacific Ocean into China, you've got upwards of 90% of your people on the ocean side of that line and virtually nobody out here. So this is in China. Yeah, so this is a great place to put stuff. This picture is very recent. This hangar is so long that you could take any U.S. aircraft carrier and sit her inside. You just put her on her keel and she would slide into the tank. That's how big this thing is. Because if you want to have heavy lift vehicles, lighter than air vehicles, above 60-ish thousand feet, gas doubles, remember, they get to be monstrous. Now, you may only put two of them in here, but you also need this thing to be almost 200 feet high right? Because the thing is big. So this is a hangar for things that are many, many times bigger than any hangar we have for anything we flew in the 1930s. I mean, what was the biggest ship then? 750 feet or something like that? Then, and the point to this right here is that they're building all kinds of new stuff. So there's all kinds of construction going on. And then you get to this, if you read that, Here's a Chinese 
military commentator saying, yeah, and we're going to kill you. They're not even hiding this part. Here is a different picture of the same thing. That is their little prototype airship. You see the nice little tower right there? So that's the one that's 180 ish feet long or so, right? So there it is at their airship base. And there it is one. The question earlier was why did, they, did everybody call it a balloon? Why did they fly a balloon? You could extend that question into why fly such a crude thing? Because that literally balloon with a payload below that makes it an airship is really crude. That science fair level stuff it has no future. Its aerodynamic drag is so massive that it can never be developed further than it is. It's relatively easy to find, relatively easy to build. Why would you do that? Because you don't want to lose this. If you if they had flown this over the U.S. in exactly the same track, like I said earlier, folks like you would have gone absolutely nuts up. Because this thing, going nuts up. yeah, this doesn't look like a cute little balloon, right? This looks like something that has a real purpose, and it looks way more capable because it is. They flew this around the world four years ago. But not over the U.S.? Uh, they, I think they went over Central America. I believe so not over the continental U.S. But we knew about it. No, they announced it. When it got back, they announced it. The Chinese announced they flew this thing around the world, but only after the home. It's, so it's still the U.S. Well, again, um, what's the radar going to see on that? If you're lucky, you're going to see the underside of the solar cells. However, your Doppler not going to erase it. So somebody in the Philippines clearly took a picture of it. But you can't announce it beforehand because you can't fly around the world without violating someone's airspace somewhere. That, one more time, is on the order of magnitude of this thing that we developed earlier. So similar size, similar shape. This thing is much older, like 20-ish years almost. So we were doing the same thing as a reminder, as a prototype for the much bigger, more capable one, which is exactly what they're doing too. Kind of burn through these rapidly because uh, I'm so far over time. These are just the topics we'll touch briefly. Uh, one thing back to that jet stream, I think you hammered that point quite a bit, is that you can either use the jet stream or you have to deal with it, one of the two. These uh, flight vehicles deal with it with altitude. So they get above the jet stream. That doesn't mean they're stuck there. If the jet stream is going where they want to go, like China to North America, then they can float down into just the top of it so that they're in, let's say, 50 knot winds and not 200 knot winds before they can. Yeah. So the jet stream is still very relevant, even to the airplanes. Those solar powered airplanes, when they're sprinting in full daylight with full power, they might get to 80 knots an hour. Maybe. They're not going to resist the jet stream very much. Either. And then we have a quick reminder of the ground track that the Chinese airship flew. Let's see, we've got missiles all over the place here. We've got bombers all over the place here. We've got some more bombers over here. And then, of course, this is this post is solid military right here. here. Uh, so were they not doing surveillance did they not transmit anything back well we'll figure that out yourself thank you i'm gonna have to edit out all this looking i think it's pages on the stick okay camouflage we talked about being stealthy you know that optical is the best way to find these things but take a look at that same picture again look what happens when the dark blue solar cell gets against the dark blue sky it vanishes, right? Simple. So the solar cells are here. Now, this is a low resolution photo, but the point is if the colors get similar, it vanishes. Camouflage is easy if the background is uniform. It's really hard if the back background is buried or moving. So this is as uniform and buried as it is. 
So this is easy. This person There we go. So what would you do? Well, you take your little balloony thing and you dye it. And then you were asking about solar cells and how to hide those. You take your payload thing and you wrap solar cells around it. Not only do you get that same blue-ish color, but now your radar bounces off. It goes the wrong way. Simple. Okay, so why must China attack? Now we're into other side. I'm sure everyone here is experienced enough to understand how dictatorships work and that you have to basically worry about keeping your internal people happy. Now look at China because it's a special case. It lost 20 million people in World War II. When China could not defend itself, it kind of like, let's say, trusted the international system. This happened too. This also kind of explains Russia, by the way, which has been invaded pretty much every generation for a thousand years. So the Chinese and the Russians are dictatorships with this history. You notice the next couple down is like not there anymore, not even any gone. But the two big ones are paranoid for really good reason. That colors everything. And now that we are getting more upset with China, we are starting to tighten the screws on. So you have a paranoid dictatorship that we're tightening the screws on. Sounds like Japan. Yeah, Japan in the 30s. Yeah. Then you add on to that that their economy is no longer growing explosively. Because mm -hmm. when their growth gets down to seven ish percent, they feel like a recession. It's then I can explain all that in a way out of time. You then take this stuff, and especially that youth unemployment part. And you now have a bomb inside your country that is especially bad in China for cultural reasons. I can talk about any one of these if you want. The point is that all of this stuff is going in the wrong direction. Youth unemployment is a huge big deal because revolutions are led by the old, but they're fought by the young. Okay. And then you get down to here, this dictator's deal. So the dictator's deal in China has always been we will pull you out of poverty and make your day-to-day -day life better as long as you leave the politics alone. That's the deal. The economy will continue to grow. Everybody will get richer. You'll be more comfortable. You'll live longer. Your kids will have a better future. Just don't go near the politics. That's their deal. If the economic side doesn't work, the deal doesn't work. And in China, that's especially bad because for a full 2,000 years, they have had a cultural right to rebel against bad governments. Now, you can call it evil, you can call it failed. The point is, the Chinese culture has baked into it a right to rebel. Now, Americans have a right to rebel just because we're us. You know, when, when we closed our borders, the China, it, Brits shipped all their criminals to Australia because they couldn't come in anymore. But that's, that's a cultural mindset. That's not an express right like they have. And you just combine all of this stuff with the youth unemployment and the right to rebel. And about the only thing a dictator can do is start a foreign war. You start a foreign war to distract your people, to juice your economy, to maybe get more resources. But dictators throughout history have started wars to distract the people. Now, Japan started the war for resources, but yeah, there was a bunch of patriotism going on too. So now you have the big guy right here saying openly, we're not liking this. Then you tack on all that stuff about Taiwan, okay, where the Chinese people have been conditioned to think that Taiwan is always ours and we just want it back. You add to that their currency. Chinese currency, with the notable exception of COVID right here, has been declining for a very long time. Now, internally, that doesn't mean a lot, but it's and with an export-based economy, that's not a bad deal. But it also means that you're not going to get the external stuff like 
steel, coal, gas. They have almost no petroleum, for example. So all of those things that you need to make your economy better so everybody's life improves and so they can see the future getting better and better like for their kid. Their kid. You, um, you, you tack on a defining currency and that becomes much harder. Earlier, I talked about population bomb, by the way. I'm sure everybody's noticed that they no longer have the one child policy. China and Japan especially have such low birth rates that they're going to get negative values on their real estate, uh, which is already inflated. So they've got they've had that problem, and, and you'll have fewer and fewer buyers, fewer and fewer people to care for everybody. And just like Japan, the Chinese essentially don't allow immigration. So now you've got fewer kids taking care of more and more old people, and you can't import your caregivers. <laughs> Questions about China? We're about to take a hard look at it. Yeah, thank you. And again, these are just the details I didn't want to spend time on earlier. Airship design. Like I said, the aerodynamics up there are really weird. I obviously had to learn that kind of stuff because I didn't get that another way. As you get either bigger or faster, either one, your shapes have to change sort of like that. But down here, You've got the almost normal looking thing that those prototypes flying around. And some of these shapes are really, really hard to make. So if you're gonna build one, you kind of have to compromise, which is that Lockheed Martin thing you saw and the uh, Chinese one you saw there in this class and getting this little pinched thing working back here is really hard. Okay, so it wasn't very prominent. But as you get up into the really big ones, you've got to start looking like this or you will have so much drag you cannot move. So if you see airship designs are no kidding looking like this and they're 600, 800 feet long, you know, they look sort of like that, then you know they're really dangerous. They look like goldfish from the bottom. They're way Yeah, I agree. So then you take those aerodynamic concepts and you apply them to real designs and you get stuff up like this. Again, prototype size, pretty small. But you can see how they built that extension here by hanging fins on it. These guys, see how that's a little shorter of a tail, if you will? It's back here. These are real designs 20, 18 years ago that these entities said we're going to build, and then they never did. There are a couple of companies that are openly building these things outside of China. This one is in New Mexico. And they, I can't see the back end, but it's that 180 ish foot prototype ish size. Uh, the company claims this one is flown at 65,000 feet. They won't publish any images. And that's not enough power. Hmm. So I think they're blown smoke. The only image they publish is this thing floating at about a 30 degree angle of climbing, but they only show it to about 1,000 feet. So frankly, I think this is a fraud but it's somebody building an airship. I offered to drive down and talk to them. They didn't return the car. <laughs> so the question was, what's the commercial potential for these things? It is massive. I literally, that little company I was speaking for, we analyzed that stuff. That was our job. And some of the forecasts we put out had trillions of dollars involved in them. That if you start now in 18-ish years, you'll be making a trillion dollars because you can do primarily communication. There's a huge market for communication. You can get photos of literally a street kid in India somewhere sitting on a, just a street you wouldn't want to breathe near with a new cell phone. It's that's so important that he's going to put his resources in the communication. Hugely important. So massive market. It would be a better market to put these commercially into the world of satellites. Before. They are serious threat to satellites. Commercially, they are serious threat to satellites. But again, that's why we got fired. Now, the satellites we were fired in favor of collapsed under their own technical failings. We didn't get either one, but they were a huge, as in terminal threat to satellites. You can do a lot of things that satellites cannot do, like sit. Yeah. Or be the one cell tower. So the Starlink thing that um, Musk is doing, 
don't know if you've seen the terminals, but they are twice the size of this. You have to basically open a suitcase and point it, and then the satellites have to take your suitcase. You can't move. The satellites track you, and then this satellite passes off the next one. And there's a lot going on in space that you need to make this thing work for the guy with this huge array on the ground. That's what it takes to put internet in space. Whereas if you put one of these airshipy things overhead, you would just need a decent antenna on your top and top. top. Well, you can't read that. It says, how do you control balloons, airships, and airplanes? Again, we're into the fine details now. So if you are a balloon, as we've talked about many times, you cannot, you're not powered. So you control yourself by finding wind going the way you want to go and then getting out of the wind when you don't want to go that way anymore. Again, you saw this before. This was offered by a credible company. I think they're in Oregon. They've got a real strong and deep history on extreme altitude scientific balloons, like 130,000 feet kind of thing. So they said, we will build you a super pressure balloon with a big payload, right? I said 2,000, I'm sorry. Big payload, really high, and it'll stay up there for a very long time and we'll control it by going up and down to kind of stay over the part of your state you want to be in. And if you're doing communications, that's good enough. Now, if you're not a balloon, you need something that moves you along. This is for my patent. These are propulsors, which if you were to take a tugboat and pull it out of the water, you'd find these on the bottom. They don't use propellers. They use these windmill looking things because when you spin them and change the angle on the blades, you can put the thrust in any direction you want. So tugboats can do whatever they want because of this. So I thought, well, an airship would be cool because you put that on there, you don't need any things because the propulsion will do whatever you want. And again, you've seen this before, this is the Chinese thing, big conventional propellers, big fins. Maybe you gimbal the propeller a little bit so you get a little thrust factoring out of it. All pretty simple stuff. Now, this thing uh, is almost 25 years old. It's very, very early solar-powered airplane. You notice it doesn't have a tail because they had to reduce the drag so much because they could barely survive in the air that they got rid of the tail and they used differential thrust by running these propellers at a different speed than those propellers. And it just turns it slightly. Outrageously hard to control. They didn't all survive. Yeah. But the point is that there's ways to do this that are not a conventional tail because up in really thin air, aerodynamic controls are really hard to do. Airplanes have much more trouble in this environment than do lighter than air things like airships. Okay, how high can they fly? We projected it right away. <laughs> Here we are, back using English again. You're welcome. So if you are tied to the ground where that tether is part of your payload, you're not going to get very high. The highest one I know of is like 15,000 feet, and the thing was way bigger than the bigger one to get up there. But you put it up for a month. So that's okay. Then let's see. You get back to those airshipy things again. And both those and the airplanes are talking 60-ish to 80-ish thousand feet, maybe 75,000. And that U2 we discussed earlier uh, claims 80,000. It may actually be a little better. So they, that flies in the same environment as well. Then when you get up even higher, now you're talking free floating balloons. This one has a heavy payload and is not tremendously big. Call it 200 ish feet. If you remember, gas doubles every 10,000 ish roughly. If you want to get up much higher than that, now you either have a tiny, tiny little payload, which is what these weather balloons do. As an aside, the, uh, during that Chinese airship thing, everybody's saying, well, why don't we know where these balloons are? They get hit airplanes, it's awful. These things follow the bird strike rule. So your payload cannot be heavier than six pounds. And you don't want any, you don't want a six pound steel ball, you want some fluffy thing that does not weigh more than six pounds, which is a bird. So if you hit this with your airliner, 
you're protected by the fact that the birds can't penetrate the airline. Make sense? That's why they don't track them, because it's, there's really no way to track these things. And if you want more than a six pound payload, you have to string the payloads together far enough apart that you're not going to get to them. That's why these things can do that. So they're very, very light, and they get, like I said earlier, to a float level wherever they're supposed to pop, and they just burst into confetti and the payload comes back in the parachute. Then, if you want to get even bigger and higher than that, now you're into those really big scientific balloons you see in the science shows. These things are massive. And this is also unpressurized, which means they're lighter. So that gas bubble will expand and the thing will get kind of roundish, but it will vent gas so that it doesn't develop so much internal pressure that it pops. It can carry huge payloads, really, really high, 120 ish thousand feet. But they end up being the size of your entire city block. They're so big by the time you get there. Okay, we had a, a question implied earlier. Why would China fly this thing instead of a better thing? Well, the answer is you don't want to lose the better thing. So again, here's a version of what they're flying around. You can see the propellers, right? All the machinery in here. Like I mentioned earlier, this is a science fair project. It has no future. You can't make them much better than they are right here. Even these guy wires that are suspending the things, even those generate significant drag. A round cable generates significant drag. So this thing has no future. Well, that's okay because one, they're cheap and easy to make and you don't lose them. See? So they want this, to be seen over the US and lost as they test us one time, they don't get to do it again. And not this thing, because it's scary and they don't lose it. Now, almost to the end, why not shoot it with a gun? F-22's got a gun. A-10 pilots think it's a pretty wimpy gun, but it's got one. So why not shoot it? Well, you saw this detonation, right? It, this one, a few milliseconds later, you can start to see the, the envelope being ripped open. And now you see that talcum powder inside. That matters. So let's take a look at it. And like I said before, the powder marks the impact. So here we have the impact. That's where the thing blew up. Here's the balloon itself, the, the fabric, let's call it, the plastic. The payload has already fallen this far. And there's the F-22. You can see that in the just a few seconds he was going by, he's really close to all that debris flying down. That's what made this shot so on the ragged edge of his capabilities and so dangerous and why they wanted to pass the lock from one airplane back to another one so he could shoot much farther away before his own sensors could pick it up. It didn't work. This tells you that if he was trying to shoot a gun, which has an entirely different problem, you have him moving at Mach 1.3. Well, the cannon shells are only moving about Mach 1.5. So he's moving at the speed of a, a pistol bullet. The cannon shells are moving at the speed of a rifle bullet, which means by the time he gets within range, and again, I think you've got a wimpy little gun, by the time he gets within range where you can put the gun sight on the balloon, he's already dead because before he's close enough to pull the trigger, he's committed to hitting the target. Way outside the range of the gun, he's committed to hitting the target because of that. So, so, ladies first. <laughs> so now that we know about these Chinese airships and that they have this capability, what do we do about it? How do we look at the next things? You ask the question. <laughs> you know I'm not going to touch that. So, so, so you said, in your opinion, Taiwan would be invaded in the next 14, 14 months, as far as what I remember you saying. Is that correct? Why? Well, politically, and that's just a combination of my poli sci background and this technology. They've already got the near space stuff ready to go. They've got it as ready as it needs to be. But you see, when you're Fighting with balloons, this is really simple. Literally, I could have done this 15 years ago. If we had stayed on track, literally 15 years ago. 
If you forward now to our next election, which is going to tear this country apart, no matter who wins, you are then going to have the Taiwan's strongest ally in complete chaos. So now you invade Taiwan. We may or not even want to do anything about it. And if we want to, now you start shooting down airliners and sinking carriers. But you may not even have to. The chaos may do it for you. So that's why I'm thinking 14 years months. That's a scary deal. Okay. Regarding the 